My name is Michael Brownlow, B-R-O-W-N-L-O-W. And on the day that President Kennedy was killed, I came down that day from Oak Cliff. We rode the bus down that morning. As you see me pointing over to the corner of Maine and Houston, President Kennedy had come down the, I think it's like 16 blocks after they had turned coming from Love Field. They came from the east end of Dallas, some 15, 16 blocks from here at all told. And when they got to Maine and Harwood, they made a right-hand turn off of Harwood onto Main Street, the main third floor, coming through downtown Dallas. And they came down the 14, 15 blocks. When they got over to that corner, right over there, ladies and gentlemen, that is the corner of Main Street and Houston Street, Vada in Dallas, Texas. So the motorcade got there. Uh, there were six motorcycle officers in the lead, uh, one by himself, and then there was uh, the chief of police, Jesse Carey's car. He was in front of the, the president's car, probably maybe uh, 25, 30 yards in front. Well, as the limousine finally got to that corner, they made the right-hand turn off of Maine onto Houston for this one block where you see the old county jail and the records building, the white building there. That's the county jail where you see them working today. That's the records building, the white building. So they came up that one block for that point. And then, ladies and gentlemen, so we enter this right here into the documentary here. This picture right here, this, this is a colored picture and taken by Mr. James Hawkins of the Associated Press. And as you can see in this picture, ladies and gentlemen, there's President Kennedy, there's Miss Kennedy, and Mr. Hawkins captured everybody in the background. So when he did that, ladies and gentlemen, right there in the red and white plaid shirt, that is definitely, most definitely, yours truly. That's me, and my name is Michael Brownlow. We were standing on the corner. There's my grandmother, Miss Vivian Neal, my Aunt Hattie Mae Williams, my Aunt Jeffy Mae Spencer. And we were standing in front of the Dow Tex building. That's the dark red building there on the northeast corner of, U of um, Houston and Elms. Well, as you can see right here, ladies and gentlemen, the president's limousine is just about to make the turn. So Mr. Hawkins filmed this from behind and he captured us in the background. Well, they make the turn, ladies and gentlemen, and as they make the turn, where you see those three signs over the road there, those three big signs, I kind of use those signs as a mark because those signs were not there in 63. But I use them kind of as a mark. You see that X. Because they put that X there and they tell people that's where the first shot hit President Kennedy and that's not true. President Kennedy was hit about two feet further back from that X. That X needs to be about two feet further back, maybe even three, but definitely two. And that shot, ladies and gentlemen, hit President Kennedy in the Adam's apple just below, right here. It hit him in the very front, from the front. That shot came, the first shot, from the grassy knoll, that fence you see right over there. Now, a lot of people come here and think that this is the grassy knoll, uh, that's the grassy knoll. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the grassy knoll right there, that fence. And there was a standard five-foot fence there on the day of the assassination. Well, as we know, and you were here a while ago, Mr. Abraham Zapruder, I saw him when he climbed up here. Mr. Zapruder climbed up here with Miss Sitzman. They were standing up here on this pedestal. Four-foot pedestal. So that put him in about eight to nine feet in the air. And as the president's car started down, he naturally started capturing the shots as they were hitting the president. Now we're gonna pan back here to the middle of the grass because right here in the middle of this grass, ladies and gentlemen, was the Stimmons Freeway sign. And as Mr. Zapruder was filming, the first shot he caught and it hit President in the, in the, in the throat, President Kennedy. But the, when the second shot hit President Kennedy in the shoulder, Mr. Zapruda could not capture that because the Stimmons Freeway sign blocked his view. And if you'll zoom in on this picture right here, 
you can see the top of the Stimmons Freeway sign. There it is right there. Now, Mr. Zapruder filmed the first shot that hit Fred and Kennedy. You see, that's the first shot that hit him right there in the throat from the front. But when the second shot hit Fred and Kennedy in the shoulder, Mr. Zapruder couldn't film that because that sign was blocking his view. And as the president was behind that sign, he was hit in the shoulder and then one shot hit Governor Connolly in the upper shoulder and another shot hit Governor Connolly in the lower shoulder. Well, this is when they lied and said that one bullet, which is called the single bullet theory or the magic bullet, whatever you, term you want to use, they said that a bullet went through President John Kennedy into the Texas governor, John Connolly. Well, that's not true. No. No bullet went through President Kennedy and to the governor. Later that evening at Parkland Hospital, Governor Conley was interviewed by CBS and NBC on the day of the assassination. And him and his wife, Miss Nellie Conley, both stated that Governor Conley was hit by two different bullets. Governor Conley said these very exact words. He said, I was hit by two different missiles. He used the word missile. And he was. So, Mr. Zapruda was here filming, ladies and gentlemen. The first shot hit President Kennedy there. The second shot hit him up there. Governor Conley was hit up there. All those shots hit those two men where you see that first X up there in the middle of the street. In that area, that's where the first set of shots were hit. And if you were paying in to that yellow dot on the sidewalk there, right in the middle, that's where the man was with the umbrella. And as President Kennedy's limousine, just like that car is now, started into the turn, he had opened up the umbrella and you could see the umbrella going up and down real slow. Everybody in this plaza saw that. You couldn't help but see it because he was out in the middle of the plaza there on the sidewalk. And everybody was filming. Mr. Zapruder, you see it in the, you see it in the Zapruder film. The umbrella man was the signal man. And he was standing there on the sidewalk among several people. You see the two buildings, the two buildings. The building across the street, that's the building I was standing in front of. It was called the Dow Tex building. And on the very roof of that building, was Mr. Charles Nicoletti. He was shooting from that building. That's who was on top of the Daltex building. You see the orange brick building over the top of the trees here, ladies and gentlemen. And that building was called the Texas School Book Depository. And in the far most east sixth floor window, and that window where they said Lee Harvey Oswald was, was in reality a man named Malcolm, M-A-L-C-O-L-M, Wallace, W-A-L-L-A-C-E. And Mr. Wallace was shooting from the sixth floor window. His fingerprints were later found up there. He did not work at the Texas School Book Depository. To my knowledge, other maybe than Oswald, he didn't know anybody there. Mr. Wallace was a known professional hitman who had ties with the government and London Johnson. So why in the world would he be up there if he wasn't up there shooting? There was no other reason for him being there, but his fingerprints, which is now available, you can see him on the internet, people are looking at him. His fingerprints were found up there. And Mr. Wallace was a known hitman, and he definitely had deep ties with London Baines Johnson. So shots came from those two buildings, the roof of the Dow Tex building, Charles Nicoletti, the sixth floor wonder, Malcolm Wallace. Mr. Lee Harvey Oswald, the man who they said shot the president, he was down on the second floor in the lunchroom. A lady named Miss Geraldine Reed, R-E-E-I-D, -E a lady named Delores Reed, R-E-E-D, a lady named Miss Consuelo de la Garza, who was sitting in the lunchroom. One lady coming down right in the hallway of the second floor and she saw Oswald as he crossed back into the room from getting the change from Miss Reed to get him a Coke out of the Coke box. Her name was Helen Martin, Helen Martin. And those four ladies were in or around the lunchroom as the shots began to ring out. Miss Sandra Stiles and Miss Victoria Adams were coming down from the fourth floor. They had left the fourth floor, were coming down the west stairway. 
And as the shots began to ring out, they heard them and it startled them. Uh, Miss Adams said, well, she said, I guess, you know, us being women, she said, they startled us and we heard several shots. She said, not no three, more than any three. And they didn't count the shots. They wasn't there to do that. They, they were scared, kind of. They heard several shots. And they were asked, did they see anybody on that stairwell passing them after the shots? Within a minute. And they told them no. That no one passed them going up the stairs or coming down the stairs. And they can, and within, after kind of settling down to, I guess, 45 seconds or whatever, I'm not, I wasn't there in the, in the building with them, I don't know, but they finally made their way on to the lunchroom. And of course, the, shot, the shots had already occurred. So now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go and go behind the corner of the fence to the grassy knoll. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are standing on the grassy knoll. If it seems to be a little darker, that's because we're under the two big oak trees. Those two trees, and you see them right here in this picture, they were here on the day of the assassination. This structure right here to my left, as you pan Mr. Clemens' pans, this is called a pergola. This, this all was built from the years of 1938-1940 by the WPA, Works Projects Administration. It was a program started by Fred and Roosevelt to help people get jobs, and they built parks and stuff like this. Of course, this particular park, which was built by that program, was built though in honor also of the Dealey family of Dallas, and that's why they call it Dealey Plaza. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the gentleman you see here behind me, and Mark and I have been on TV together. We, uh, Miss Barbara Davidson, Channel 8 News here in Dallas, Dallas Morning News. We've been in documentaries. Uh, this is Mr. Mark Oakes. Mr. Oakes, uh, originally from the St. Louis area, uh, he's been researching the Kennedy assassination now for 36, 37 years. Uh, he interviewed many, many people that were here. Uh, he interviewed a lady named Miss Patsy Pascal. Uh, she was in the fourth floor of the old red courthouse and she was filming from that floor and in her film you can see the flashes of the gun behind the fence and many people running up here you see all the witnesses running to the grass and oh some we're talking 150 people running up here including several police so why in the world would all of these people run up here if the last shot didn't come from here not only did they hear it and see it saw the puff of smoke. Many people were pointing toward the fence. Right here in this particular picture, you see Officer W.R. Hill. You see Officer Hargis has jumped off his motorcycle. He was splattered with blood and brain. Uh, Miss Mary Mormon and Jean Hill are in that picture, Mary Ann Mormon. Uh, Miss Mormon is still living. I talk to her quite often. Uh, very recently, she's been pretty sick, but. I think she's rebounding from the last time I talked to her. Mary Mormon is still living. That's Mary Ann Mormon today. Also known by her married name, Mary Ann Kramer. Her husband, uh, Mr. Gary Kramer, passed away about a year and a half, a couple years ago. But uh, Miss Mormon is still living. And that's her right there on the day of the assassination. And she was across the street with the fake lady in the famous red coat, Dean Hill. And of course, Miss Mary Mormon is the lady who took the famous grassy old picture. That's this photograph right here. She took the black and white Polaroid picture of the president as he was hit in the head. And this is when all that blood went back and splattered Officer Hargis on his motorcycle. He was just covered with brain matter and blood, little chunks of brain. Miss Kennedy crawled out on the trunk of the limousine and uh, she reached out and grabbed a huge piece of President Kennedy's brain. And she put it back in his head and held it there uh, until they got him over to Parkland Hospital about two miles from here. That's where they took him. Even though they knew that President Kennedy was not going to survive, they did everything that the doctors would normally do naturally. But this was a severe head gunshot from both directions. And the right and back side of his head was gone. You can see that right there in that picture. There was no saving him, and he died uh, at one o'clock. Uh, Mr. Oates has Patsy Pascal's film. Uh, it's the white DVD there. Miss Pascal made the front page of the Dallas Morning News. 
and uh, you can see the film and see the flashes. So we, we're gonna go behind the fence right now for about 10 minutes, Brother Mark, and then we'll be back. I'm standing right now. This is the area and the very spot known as the Grassy Knoll. And ladies and gentlemen, I just showed you a few minutes ago, that's me on the day of. And then here's Mary Ann Mormon, that's Miss Mary Ann Mormon, the lady who took the famous black and white picture. About 30 minutes ago, Mr. Kramer, the man that's doing this documentary, his own, for his own personal use and mine, uh, he asked me about a lady called the Babushka Lady. And in her film, ladies and gentlemen, you could actually see the two gunmen shooting. She filmed that film and it was in color. And she had came down that day to see the president like everybody else. She brought her mother's camera with her and uh, she filmed the grass, you know. She was standing about three feet and to the right of Mary Mormon and Jean Hill across the street over there in the grass. Her name is, was the Babushka lady, but her name is Miss Beverly Oliver. And ladies and gentlemen, in the red dress right there, that's Beverly Oliver today. I think Miss Oliver is somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 or 71 now. Very much alive. And uh, she lives about, uh, oh, some 30 minutes uh, east of Dallas, as does Marina Oswald, Oswald's with her. She, they both live in the same town, uh, 30, about 30 minutes east of Dallas, and Oswald's two daughters, June and Rachel. They all live just east of here. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's pan the camera over to here. The first shot that hit President Kennedy, the very first shot that hit him came from right here, this very spot. This is the shot that hit President Kennedy in the throat. And the man that fired this shot from here, the man they call the badge man, as you and I were talking earlier, because he was dressed in a Dallas police uniform. Many witnesses back here saw him. The very first shot fired, and this shot was fired over this fence, over that white wall, and it hit President Kennedy in the throat. The man that fired that shot was that man right there in the white shirt and the sunglasses. And he was six foot two inches tall, weighed about 205 pounds. He's a native Texan, born in Huntsville, Texas. And his name was Charles Boyd Harrell, better known to many people in the 50s 60s and, and the 70s, he was known as Charles Hitman Harrelson. Charles Hitman Harrelson. And of course, his other great claim to fame was the fact that he is definitely the father of actor Woody Harrelson. That is Woody Harrelson's father. And Woody and uh, Charles Harrelson stood right here, and he fired the very first shot. He was known as the Badge Man again because. He was wearing and dressed in a Dallas police uniform. And that was the first shot that hit President Kennedy in the throat. Mr. Harrelson admitted that in 1966 in an interview he done with NBC, who actually the actual reporter was to this day. I really don't know. I've been told it, it could have been uh, Sam Donaldson at a very early part of his career. However, I don't know that for a fact, but someone at NBC interviewed Mr. Harrelson, and ladies and gentlemen, he admitted that he fired the first shot. So that's the first shot that hit President Kennedy. And then I'm going to lay my hand right here, because ladies and gentlemen, this is where the very last shot that day came from. Now, just before this shot was fired, just keep following me, Mr. Pointing over the fence toward the bridge. And down on the street over there, shots were going off. And Mr. James Tigg was standing over there by the abutment of the bridge. That's where he was standing. He was just an innocent bystander standing over there hollering, Mr. President, Miss Jackie, Miss Kennedy. And one of the five missed shots hit the curb across the street. But the bullet remained pretty much intact when it ricocheted. And when it ricocheted, it went right into his face, down by the bridge, not, not here in the middle, as some of these tour guides out here tell people that's not true. It 
hit Mr. Tigg down there by the bridge, just a few feet from him, and the fragments of the bullet and the concrete shrapnel went into his face. So just as the bullet hit Mr. Tigg in the face, ladies and gentlemen, again, my hand right here. The last shot, the very last shot fired from the grass, you know, where I'm standing, where my hand is, where you see me right here. It was a Remington 222 XP100. It was a big silver pistol with a telescopic sight. And the man that fired this shot is very much alive. He was released from prison May the 6th, 2016. He had been locked up since 1981. He had a shootout with several Chicago police officers. I think one of them died like three or four days later. And he was charged with the murder of a police officer and the attempted murder of several others, even though they actually attacked him or brought the gunfight on. And uh, he had a shootout with them and uh, he was captured, uh, went to trial and was given, a, actually the death penalty first, then if the sentence was commuted to life in 1984, when the government again abolished the death penalty. So he was locked up at Statesville Prison up in uh, Joliet, Illinois. And ladies and gentlemen, in 1964, 64, when he was, I think at the age of 23 or 24, he admitted then that he fired the last shot from here and that he hit Fred and Kennedy in the head. He said, when the bullet hit Fred and Kennedy, as I told you earlier, the blood went back and splattered off the Hargis. He watched it through the telescopic sight and he said he thought the bullet had went through the president and also hit Officer Hargis because Officer Hargis had so much blood on him, but actually it was just blood because the bullet disintegrated in the president's head. A millimeter of a second before, ladies and gentlemen, this shot was fired. And, and also with the shot that hit Mr. Tigg, you got three shots all more than within the same second almost. Uh, Malcolm Wallace fired his last shot from the sixth floor Texas School Book Depository and hit President Kennedy in the back of the head. He had a 30 off six. So you had a, two shots in a John Kennedy's head where that X is out there in the street. Two different bullets entered his head. One had also hit him in the throat, one had hit him in the shoulder. Governor Connolly was hit twice and, and uh, Mr. Tigg was hit. Ladies and gentlemen, the man who shot and killed John Fitzgerald Kennedy is that man right there. That's the man who killed Fred M. Kennedy. His name is James Files, F-I-L-E-S. As it tells you right here, Mr. Files was released from prison May the 6th, 2016, on parole. And he is on parole today. Now, I understand that he lives somewhere very close to the Dallas area, is what I've been told. Uh, do I know that for a fact? No, but I've been told that by some very credible sources. But he has admitted you can get his documentaries. He's got several. Uh, Mr. Joe West, a private investigator from Houston, Texas, discovered him in later years, but he had already admitted back in the 60s that he shot the president. But Joe West went to the full level and uh, uh, brought forth the evidence that James Files, born as James Sutton, he was born James Sutton, changed his name to James Files. He worked in the guidance of Charles Nicoletti for the Mafia and had deep ties with many people in the Mafia and the government, as did Oswald. Ladies and gentlemen, to sum this up, there is no doubt whatsoever, as we all know, Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested that day for shooting a Dallas police officer named J.D. Tippett over in Oak Cliff at the corner of 10th and Patton. Now, that being said, that is the only murder that Oswald committed that day. I myself do believe, with all the evidence of the policeman who was straight and told the truth, the witnesses who saw it, Oswald shot Officer Tippett, but the only reason that he shot Officer Tippett, Officer Tippett was supposed to kill Lee Harvey Oswald. He was to silence the Patsy. J.D. Tippett, Jack Ruby and Lee Harvey Oswald, all three knew each other when this happened. They were not strangers with each other at all. 
and Tippett had been ordered by Ruby for the government and whoever else was involved, Mafia included, to kill Oswald that day. And that's why he knew he, ladies and gentlemen, there's no way, nobody knew where Oswald went when he left the building. And the government, the sixth floor of the uh, uh, Warren Commission admitted that. The FBI admitted they, Dallas police, when Lee Harvey Oswald left the building three minutes after the shots, nobody knew where he went. And when J.W. Will Fritz, the famous homicide detective of the Dallas Police Department, when he sent them to pick Oswald up, when they said he missed the roll call, I don't know about that, but somewhere or another they discovered he wasn't there and they kind of thought he was involved. He did have uh, ties with the uh, Russian government, the American government, the mafia. He was an ex-Marine. Oswald was an agent and he had many, many little inquits in this. There ain't no doubt about it, up to his neck. But he didn't find any shots from that window, none whatsoever. Uh, I told you, Malcolm Wallace, James Files, Charles Nicoletti, and, and uh, uh, Charles Harrison were the four gunmen who were shooting in Dealey Plaza that day, there's no doubt. And uh, this is the famous grassy knoll where we're standing. Uh, there was a fence here, standard five foot fence here that day, just like this one you see behind me. Uh, no guardrail was here. This parking lot we're standing in was here. All of this has been here since 1940. And so this was all here some 23 years before President Kennedy was killed. But uh, this is the famous grass in old. The last shot came from here. Uh, being here that day, as I was, standing on the corner up there, we saw the puff of smoke. That's me on the day of the red and white flag shirt. Michael Brownlow. This picture was taken by the Associated Press, Mr. James Hawkins. And this is some 12 to 14 seconds before the first shot hit President Kennedy. And I saw it, saw the whole thing, never will forget it. So that's why I come down and do tours and talk to people. I've been in Dallas all my life. And uh, I try to show people what really happened. Uh, the sixth floor museum is professionally done. Uh, shots did come from the sixth floor window, yes, but not by Malcolm Wallace. And then the last shot came from the grass in Oak. That's what is not being told up there and uh, they they tell the Warren Commission story uh, because that's what they're told to, to tell but that's not true. Uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was just what he said he was. He said I am just the patsy. He said I haven't killed anybody even though I do believe he shot off the Tippett in self-defense. Uh, he didn't plan on shooting Tippett or he didn't want to shoot him but I do believe he was uh, responsible for the death of J.D. Tippett, and he was charged with that, but he never was uh, convicted of anything because, as we know, on uh, November 24th, two days later, at 11.21 a.m. on a Sunday morning in the basement of the Dallas Police Department in Harwood in Maine, Jack Ruby went down in that basement, and as they were getting ready to transfer Oswald from the city jail, Dallas Police Department, to the county jail, Sheriff J.E. Decker, the Dallas County Jail there right across the street. That's where they were getting ready to bring off all to. And as they walked him through the basement to put him in the one of the squad cars, Jack Ruby darted out from the crowd. There were many news people down there that morning. The place was packed. And he had a snub nose 38. Hamlet's 38. He stuck it right into the, the, the stomach area of Rob Wall and fired the gun one time. And uh, the bullet in an off wall and it uh, went through his, went his stomach, it messed up his spleen, how they bounced off, hit the liver, and also the aorta. But uh, he bled to death and uh, lost unconscious, never re regained conscious, and they announced him dead at 107, uh, November 24th, at Parkland Hospital. President Kennedy was taken to Parkland Hospital, where he died. Lee Harvey Oswald was announced dead at Parkland Hospital. And on uh, January the 3rd, 1967, uh, Jack Ruby was announced dead at Parkland Hospital. That was the day he died, allegedly of cancer. He certainly didn't have cancer when uh, he shot off. So I've done this uh, little documentary with Mr. Clemens here today on the grass in old. I want to thank him for coming and certainly enjoyed meeting him. And uh, I tell this story, ladies and gentlemen, to my knowledge and what I saw I know happened. I can talk about that and what I do tell that I don't know it came from great sources, and I re not only in being here, I've researched this, and I, I do truly believe what I just told you is the honest God truth 
And Mr. Files, the man I just showed you, he fired the last shot from the glass. You know, I thank you for listening to this documentary. And uh, today is September the 12th. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, also I want to say today, a very special day to me. Uh, this morning, I drove down to his grave about 60 miles from here. As, as I just told you, Officer Hargis, this man right here, he was uh, on the motorcycle right next to President Kennedy's car and he was splattered with blood. Well, today is September the 12th and if Officer Hargis was living today, he would be 86 years old. He was born September the 12th, 1932 in Rye Vista, Texas and that's where he's buried. That's where his grave and his remains are. Uh, and he died April 25th, 2014. They uh, had his funeral on April the 29th and I was able to sing Peace in the Valley at his funeral, and I did. The old Red Foley uh, gospel song. And uh, Officer Hargis, as you can tell in this picture right here, ladies and gentlemen, I just didn't know Officer Hargis. He was like my father. You can see that in that picture. And I was around him uh, 45 years, and, uh, and uh, he knew me most of my life. And he was like a father, a mentor, and uh, he was a great man, and he was a Christian. He was a man of God, he believed in God, he was saved, and he lived in the pyramid of, of God and Jesus every day, and all the years I knew him. And he wore the badge with pride and dignity and merit and respect the way it should be. He was a Dallas police officer for 45 years, that's a long time. He joined the force in 1954 and passed away in 2000. And, uh, he joined the force in 1954, retired in 99, and he passed away in 2014. So again, uh, Mr. Clemens, thank you very much, sir. It's been a pleasure meeting you. And uh, we're gonna end the interview and uh, I thank you very much.